What's up, guys? It's your boy Gerard and your girl Gabby, and we are back with episode 25. It's a motherfucking remix. Sorry, I know we're not supposed to curse, but it's, I just got so hyped up. You got you, you got very hyped. Um, yeah, man, 25. Uh, shouts to everybody for, of course, rocking with us always, showing us a lot of love for episode 24 of the Mamba episode with Vic. Um, that was a that was a great one. We have another special guest for you guys coming up soon uh in today's episode but gabby before we get into all that what's going on in those streets i'm ready for it (laughs) there's been a lot going on in these streets gerard it's busy streets you know i signed up for the jp morgan chase corporate challenge so i'm running out in these streets doing it virtually this year you know getting my 3.5 miles on it's a little bit more than a 5k but you know slightly more a little 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 extra point three you'll be all right Wait, wait, here's the question. Are you going to rock ankle weights on this run? (laughs) I know, I know, I'm messing with you. Your girl is in the 12-minute mile group already. You think I need some damn ankle weights slowing me down? I don't think so. I'm trying to, I mean, I'm not trying to win the race. Right, right, right. I'm going to manage expectations here for everybody listening. Most people say that they're slow at running, and they're like, they'll they'll like run like Tasmanian devil like circles around me, and I'm like, no, no, no actually slow but it's okay <laughs> it's better than not doing it at all i'm trying to get back into it after a knee injury so you know yep and uh me and the grandma's in the back where we've got Listen. a nice little running group going on Love actually it. i do want to say shout to the brick city run club who has invited Ooh. me and embraced me a bunch of my sneakerhead peeps Love it. Uh, we have different books that we read every month. We've read Mama Mentality, a few others, uh, sports-related books. And every Sunday, we do a run. So I went to my first run club this week. How was it? It was great. I was Ooh. very intimidated. But like, <laughs> I, I think just being energized, being around people, and they did a, such a great job of having a socially distant yet inclusive community. It's nice and small. They have a track built uh, that they have customized. It was great. I ran my best time that I've run in weeks. So I'm very glad that you have a group and a community to run with. And I know, well, because for so many people, right, like working out, it's so much better and you're so much more motivated when you have people with you, right? That's like the athlete in you, you, like being able to compete and do the different things like that. So that's awesome. Very, very happy for you on that. Um, and then... One other thing that's been happening in the streets these this mm. week, I'm wearing my shirt to pay homage. Shabbat shalom. Shout you know, I mean, shout we, we, out we to are, DJ G Money. We and are recording on a Friday. Sam. We are recording on a Friday. It so is. It is actually it Shabbat. It's actually Shabbat. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm paying homage to my people. <laughs> Mazel tov l'chaim, you know. Shouts to Ashkenazi I. and <laughs> Jews out there. You know, Chala, matzah, all of the above, you know. I'm an emphasis on the ish. Yeah. Say Jewish, yeah. I'm, I'm an ish. You're, you're an ish. You're like, I'm, it. I'm an ish. <laughs> but shout to the Picky Eater fam and DJ yes. G for having me on as Chef Boy RG this week <laughs> on the new episode. I, you laugh it up, but let me tell you, I make a mean challah, okay? Listen, <laughs> folks, you have to watch this episode because it is funny. Um, there are references that if you like a uh, certain action comedy movie that you'll pick up, uh, Chef's to Chris Tucker, and I'll leave it at that. Um, it's just it, there's funny stuff going on in there. Some delicious foods, some Manischewitz, all sorts of uh, all sorts of uh, delicacies that are uh, particular to Gabby and her ish people. <laughs> can I can I say it? Yeah, sure. A Franco fish. I had to say it in the voice <laughs> for those who don't know. If you know, you know. If you know, you know. So check it out. We've got the link up on our our page. Um, definitely give us some love. You know. No doubt. No doubt. It's a mitzvah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mitzvah. <laughs> so yeah. So what about you, Gerard? What's going on in these wow, streets? Wow, folks, did you see that? She actually asked me what's going on in these streets. She actually I asked <laughs> every episode, but we can pretend that it gets – it feels like the first time every time, Gerard. Every I know. time. It's like the first time every time. No, it's it's been good. Um, the finals are over. Um, mm-hmm. Shouts to the Los Angeles Lakers on uh, winning their 17th NBA championship, tied with the Boston Celtics for the most all time. Shouts to LeBron James on his fourth title, fourth finals MVP. You know, he's, he's, he's doing his thing, man. Um, and shouts to the Miami Heat, man. What, what a hell of a run they went on. Jimmy Butler and Tyler Hero and Bam and Goron and, and, and everybody else. Iggy. The, Iggy, you know, Solomon Hill. Uh, who else am I missing? Duncan Robinson. I mean, they just – Coach X Bolstra, Pat Rowley, Andy Ellsberg, and that team. Miami, what I loved about watching them in the bubble this postseason was their – and it's cheesy, but like 
they just never quit, right? Like they just they just kept battling. Like yes, the blowout was on, like for 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 the for the game six win, but like you could just see that they just had no gas, right? Like I was gonna say, I think they were just exhausted. I they mean, just, they gave everything right. to every game yep. throughout the whole series. You're no doubt, completely right. No doubt. So that that was that was fun to watch, and uh, you know, as crazy as it sounds, we're already getting prepped for like next basketball season, right? Which Lord knows when that's gonna start. I mean, I'm thinking. What I'm hearing is around MLK Day, so January 18th is what mm-hmm. Adam's, Adam and Michelle are hoping for. So we got the draft coming up, free agency, all that. So, you know, if you want to find that, of course, check out the Seven Footers Podcast where you can get oh. all that information. See what I did there? I see uh, what you did there. Mm-hmm. So you can get that info. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's, it's, it's October. It's mid-October. We have a few days left until a very important day in our nation's history, right? Like... Election day is coming. <laughs> uh, I got jokes, guys. <laughs> you, you have lots of jokes. Election day is coming. Um, I said it last week. Say it again, guys. We are in a battle for democracy, and it doesn't. The battle for democracy doesn't stop. It it's continuous. I was recently watching something with the uh, the legendary Angela Davis, who is now in her late seventies. Uh, Angela's been fighting for democracy and is still fighting. Right, like we. This is this is what it is, guys. And I'm not saying that you all need to be Angela Davis's out there because none of us are capable with the intellect and all that to be Angela Davis. But we all need to do what we can to make sure that an actual democracy, right, rule by the people, is actually here versus this oligarchy that is actually happening right now. So make sure you're out there, you're voting, and you're, you're doing what you can. I agree, and pay attention to those local elections. I was listening mm-hmm. to I I think it was the Breakfast Club a couple of weeks back where they had someone on there talking about how local elections are almost more important than the national, and you know that's what we've learned in these crazy COVID times is that you know the local is what dictates how we've quarantined, how we've handled this. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. make sure that you're taking care of those officials and no voicing doubt. your opinions. It's not just about the big one coming up mm-hmm. in November, but which is very important. Make sure if you're registered Mm -hmm. to go vote, follow all the directions, look at the fine print on the back of the Mm -hmm. envelopes for those mail-in ballots. But yeah, make sure to to stay in tune. I mean, even just looking at how sports has handled from a local Mm -hmm. level, like Miami just opened up their stadium to Dolphins fans at full capacity, yet there can't be any fans in New York. Yeah. and and, So that just shows the difference and the importance of that local. I know I use sports as a microcosm of things going on in our country, but I think the NBA public fascinating florida's yeah. the wild west so florida, you know florida's a hot spot so the mm-hmm. idea of like a full open stadium to me that sounds insane uh, but yeah he will yeah. pay attention to that and again it's not just about voting right yes that's the first step but be active know what's going on if they are running on a particular platform hold them accountable you said yep. x y and z why aren't we doing this what's yep. the problem how can i help how can i get involved right like so just just be aware and be mindful of of, of what's going on and you know again it's it's this is not about it's about doing it for yourself but for everybody so that we all live in a in a more democratic society mm-hmm. uh, um i got a question for you yes though. shoot i'm gonna go back to uh you know shooters shoot so <laughs> we're gonna go back to the nba what did you think of lebron's speech and <laughs> i knew this was coming <laughs> and should jimmy butler continue to sell his coffee like where is the call <laughs> from dunkin donuts and starbucks i would love to know listen big face coffee is still out there people make sure you're out there and you're supporting jimmy <laughs> if you want to pay 20 dollars for a cup of coffee no i think i think jimmy's hype hilarious will buy it let me tell you <laughs> hype, mm-hmm. hype beast will definitely buy that i'm, I'm surprised actually a, a brand hasn't already jumped on to like partner with him and do that and like, maybe they have maybe dunkin donuts has already that's reached true. out yeah, that's true. good point they, they, dunkin donuts has been uh, up in their partnerships in general like i just had a dunkin donuts harpoon okay Pumpkin okay. beer the other day. Oh my god, pumpkin! It is pumpkin season. <laughs> pumpkin coffee with Dunkin' Donuts, and let me tell you, I I don't drink beer that much these days, but it was delightful. <laughs> I'm glad you I enjoyed. Was. It was great. I, I, it's so funny that you mentioned uh, the LeBron speech. Uh, yeah. As I mentioned, check out the Seven, seven Footers Basketball Podcast because I actually talked about you to Jenna about this, and I'll and I'll do it here. What I find is so interesting, right? Because you are an admitted LeBron James hater, right? So there's I like the word hater. I here's what I will say. You will look for things to criticize him on. Like that like that 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 is your you know, I don't I don't have to look that hard. I'll put it that way, you know? Like when you say things like I now get the respect that I deserve. Uh, uh, oh, see, you see and, this, and, and actions speak for themselves. And and and, and this you is how narrative. No and, one's going to deny that. And this is how narrative start. He didn't say that. 
He said, I want my damn respect too. You see, that's very different than now I get the respect I deserve. But anyway, semantics. I want my damn respect too. Same thing. <laughs> not quite, but okay. Um, You're, and, people respect him though. That's the thing. It's like not, no one, there's not a lack of respect there, right? And I actually saw something on, on the interweb. Yeah, there, there, that was there very moving. I, I don't know if it's from Bleach Report. I, I can fact check that one and get back to well, you. Well, but, but, but if it's Bleach Report, they probably aggregated from somewhere else, right? Well, they didn't it, do it. Right. But it was something that was like, why are we hating on LeBron? Right. Let's just appreciate the greatness while we have it to watch. And no I, that really resonated with me, no right? No As somebody who has, I don't want to say I'm a hater, but I have very strong opinions about LeBron. All because the negative. <laughs> Well, no, no, no. I, I don't say anything negative about his game on the court. I say <laughs> negative things about what he says about his game on the court. His <laughs> actions speak for themselves. He has more finals appearances than the Knicks and most of the NBA franchises. <laughs> the, the Knicks. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm a Knicks fan, so I have to call that out. But, you know, th- that speaks for itself. And I, and I said this when we had our conversation about MVP talk, right, is LeBron took it way too personally. No one needs to hear your opinion about it. People just want to see new people succeed and win. They don't want to say the same things over and over again. And I think I might have said this to you either last week or offline that when the Golden State Warriors started playing great, everyone was so excited. And now everyone started to hate them after it became a dynasty because they wanted to see new blood, (laughs) right? Like everyone's fascinated by Tom Brady in Tampa. Like there's a lot of eyes on him because it's new material. And that's my thing with LeBron, right? Is that he walks himself into these conversations. <laughs> he's a great PR team, like shouts the team around him and he's doing so many amazing things. And that's my thing is that first of all, he's going to come in and he's going to wear the same number as Jordan. Kobe didn't do that. Oh Lord. Here we, I mean, and Kobe's yes, birthday yeah, is the 23rd. Kobe, Kobe had the, birthday from Kobe had the audacity birthday. to go one number above Jordan. Cause right. Cause yeah, now, that's like in Price is Right when you're like, I'm going to go $1. Nah, I don't think that's a disrespect. Kobe's birthday is 823. If anyone had a right to wear 23 after he wore the number 8, it is Kobe. And Mama Day, you know how much it bothers my OCD that Mama Day is the 24th. Gabby, I do believe you asked me what I thought. So <laughs> back, back to <laughs> I, All right. All right. Zach Morris, time out. I'm going to let you finish. But the, no, but I, your, 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 your rant and your position – but that says it all right there, though, right? Like, the fact that you don't see Kobe wearing one number above Jordan as showing Jordan up, but you have a problem with Jordan with LeBron wearing 23, that says it all. And it's fine. I'm not judging you for it. And again, I'm bringing our friend Jenna into this. Jenna is the opposite end of the spectrum from you. She is a LeBron lover. So, but she's also she, a Kobe lover. Right? So she sees no fault in LeBron, right? So it's this, and as usual, I'm happy to play the happy medium because it's somewhere in between, right? Like... He's not without fault, and you're a little too nuts with your nitpicking, right? It is, it is somewhere in between. And the reality is LeBron is, if not already, he is one of the two greatest basketball players we've ever seen on planet Earth. Like, he is that good. And it doesn't matter what you use. Rings, MVPs, offensive box score plus minus, whatever stat you want to use, he is one of the greatest players we have ever seen. And again... He, he, I, we are on True Hoop this week. We did our, our, goat, our GOAT discussion. I've said it on here before. I'll say it again. Three men have a claim to that status. It's Kareem, it's Michael, and it's LeBron. And that's it. Ain't nobody else in there. By every measure that you look at stat-wise and wins and rings and all that, like career win shares, box ball plus minus, all PER, everything. It's those gentlemen. And look, no one is in the idea of like, I want my damn respect. LeBron, ain't nobody not respecting you, right? Well, but it's, that's why, it's, right? It's, I'm it's, it's, like... it's, 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 it's the idea of like the washed king. Who who called you a washed king? Nobody called you a washed king. Right. Some internet troll one time and now all of a sudden you have to let the rest of the internet punish for it? Like... I, think, I, I think people said, and I've said rightfully so, he is 35. Like he's getting older. Like that's a fact. But it that doesn't seem to be slowing him down much, right? He's, aging, he, he's aging like a fine wine. Like you know what I mean? Like a fine think... wine. His basketball competency is unparalleled. unparalleled. And, and, you know, like I said, for me, that seeing that, like, why don't we just enjoy him while he's here? Yes. That resonated with me because, and I, I've said this before, I have nothing negative to say about his game. Right. It's, it's, the, it's the comments that bother me. <laughs> but, I mean, like I said, he is. He's in that GOAT conversation. But 
I just like, why do you have to do the same movie that Michael Jordan did? The <laughs> same number. Like, are you going to the Bulls next and going to wear 23? Like, are you going to take it out of retirement? That's my, that's my only thing with him. Right. That's my main thing. But I, I, I will say this series, it was magical for a lot of people. And it was really interesting for me to watch as a fan mm-hmm. of who really needed that audience boost. Like that's, mm-hmm. I think partly why the Clippers fell flat. Like, I don't know if, if Kawhi is like that scene in Elf where the sleigh only rises into the air when people give enough Christmas cheer, like does Kawhi not play as well and not have his energy levels well, up if there are no fans? Like, and, and we, I don't know, but we, LeBron was nothing short of magical the entire time. He was consistent. He was solid. I, I know people will hate on that last play of what was it? Game five. Right, but that, where he passed that, the ball. Was, that was the right that play. That was the right decision. That's right. Right and play. you know, and, <laughs> Everybody misses, so like, stop sending death threats to Danny Green. Yeah, like, what's it? you know, leave him alone. He's well, got another ship. Well, listen, you know, people, people are crazy. People are wild. People I know, are crazy. Um, but I will say, from a game perspective, I have nothing but the utmost respect. I wish you didn't have to ask me. It's like it was already there, bro. Relax, <laughs> enjoy the moment. All right, but b- before we get to our guest, <laughs> um, put five J.R. Smith's shirt for him because he needs to put that back on. <laughs> Shout out to J.R. Smith. No. Um, <laughs> Before we get to our guest, I do want to talk about some some collaborations. Okay. Um, the, the Nike, so Nike and Sakai have already done stuff in the past, um, and they they have done some incredible things. Um, I know that you which uh, which one was your favorite? It, not the Blazer. I do like the Blazer Sakai that, but Blazers aren't your jam. Um, but I know that you, you you're a fan of the the LDV waffle, right? Like that was. Yeah, I loved the waffles. The LD waffles were great. I think my favorite pair was the black with the white. Okay. I thought the white on white was great too because the pops of gray gave it something nice, some light and fresh and cute That's for summer. That's interesting for you though because you're more of a color girl. I don't girl. What, a, go well, yeah, what, about, what, what about the, the – is a green and uh, – green, pink, yellow I think was the, was the one? There was one with pink. There was one that was more of a green and yellow based. I like the colors. They're just not my normal color palette. Like okay. if they started putting out stuff that had blue, blue and red, well, like yes, some of the yes. some of the the vapor waffles that are coming out in the next round, mm-hmm. they got some more of my more of the Gabby aesthetic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, royal. The royal blue. Royal is my favorite color. That cobalt blue, like the cobalt threes that came out. That I'm sure everyone is shocked by this. I took an L on. <laughs> um, Folks, if you uh, yes, royal blue or cobalt <laughs> blue. If you want to, and, and, well, I was gonna never mind. Size <laughs> seven. Well, I was going to say it might give certain people a wrong idea. Anyway, um, <laughs> the other thing that guy is doing um, and Nike, they are doing their take on the down jacket. I love a good down winter jacket. Um, and I, I, I saw some some images and, you know, they're interesting. Like, it's so funny for me and like coats, right? Like, I don't know. Like, there's something about like, unless I'm like on the sideline at like a football game and why would I be on the sideline of a football game? You might um, be, I've been there. You I, well, be yes, there. well, cause you're working like, but it, it, <laughs> like I, the whole athletic looking jacket, I don't think is my vibe anymore as a kid. Like, you know, you wear starter jackets and all that. Yeah. But like as now, an adult, I still wear starter jackets and I know what you mean though. The North face puffy yeah. coat that was like very reminiscent of the nineties yeah, and like yeah, the fubu yeah, that it was yeah. like a sportier a look. Sportier look. Yes. I, I just, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't get it. I'm just saying, where would I wear it? Like in the, because I'm much more of a, you know, now it's like the, what that look with the, the furry hood and the long, you know what I mean? That kind of like. Like the Canada Goose. Yeah. Ringer. that like, more. I love that. my Canada Goose. Shout to Canada Goose. That, yeah. Canada Goose. You want to sponsor us, please. Warmest <laughs> thing I've ever put on in my life. <laughs> or, or, or Moose Knuckle, <laughs> if you want to sponsor us. By all means, we're happy to take it. <laughs> Yeah, we're real picky over here, as, <laughs> as you guys can tell. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I I'm curious. Like, are we the target though? Right? Probably it's like not. more. I think like what I love about Sakai is it brought a fashion lens, mm-hmm. but it really tapped into the sneakerhead too. It was yeah. something different. It was a different shape. I mean, we've talked about this in terms of the Adidas superstar with Beyonce, the collab. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. said to me, it gives me a nod of the Sakai's. Mm-hmm. So that's how you know Nike is doing something right mm-hmm. and. That's why they keep coming out with more colorways. I mean, the second round of of the Sakai's too, the the vapor waffles mm-hmm. are a lot more sporty um, and a little less fashiony. I mean, it's more of a nod to a traditional Nike shoe, but of course with the unique colors and the layering. Um, so we can show a picture of that, but yep, yep. It, it's just it's a different look. And so I, the jacket to me, the puffers, takes yeah. more of a nod to that sporty side with this new collection. It does, and it's and you know to be fair, right? It, it, it's 
there's, there's a whole, it's not just the down jacket, right? It's, it's a whole outer work collection. There's yep. a variety of things they're going to have mixed in there. Um, puffers, as we mentioned, more of that like sleek, uh, short uh, waistcoat uh, that, that stops at the waist. So, uh, you know, I will say this. As they come out and I see them up close, that will determine whether I'm like, oh, you know, I, I can rock that. I, I can see that. I need okay. to, you know, it's kind of a wait and see. Not that, again, I think it's, I think they look dope, but like, I, it's a coat's a weird thing, right? Like, I have to like kind of put it on and be like, mm, how do I feel about this? <laughs> so that's the one thing, though, that is hard that a lot of people don't realize that when it comes to sneakers and streetwear and limited collections, you don't really have that opportunity you to don't. try it on. And so when people are like, why are you buying sneakers? I thought you always wear them. And you're not sure about them. And, and like for me, you remember when we talked about this with the Concord Sketch mm -hmm. 11 lows. At first I was like, that's going to be a no for me because mm -hmm. I thought it was a purple hue because of the photography. Mm -hmm. The initial photography that we saw had more of like. It, it, looked, uh, it looked more purpley. Yeah, it did. And then when it came out, I was like, oh, wait, this is a yeah. very different shade. Yeah. It's like a little bit of like a little cerulean. Mm -hmm you know, some royal nods. And I was like, this is much more blue than I thought it was. I was like, I'm actually going to go for these. But because of that, if there's something that you ever think you're interested in, you almost have to go Gotta for it and right for the best. Yeah. And then you can either sell it or return it. I mean, no well, one's going to return it these days, but no. they're going to, they're going to flip the script on that one. But you know, it, that's what makes this really hard yeah. to make those decisions. So you almost got to shoot your shot at everything. At you think everything. you might like it. See but that? that's what also makes the sneaker game so hard. See that, folks? Shoot your shot at everything. Shoot or shoot. <laughs> they also miss sometimes. Now, so they, 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 they certainly... Shooters don't always make those shots. <laughs> they, they certainly <laughs> do. They certainly do. All right, folks, we have a special guest coming up for you next. Uh, she is a journalist, pop culture, and music aficionado, has interviewed some of the biggest names in hip-hop, uh, and music in general, and she has a book out already right now, and two more coming out that, woo, y'all can't wait for. So stay tuned. What's up, guys? Gabby and Gerard, we are back, and we are joined by music and pop culture aficionado, journalist, author, Kathy Yondley. Kathy, what's up? Hello, hello. We are How's excited to have you. We How's are everybody we're okay. good. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm super hyped. I don't know. I, I, this is the most social interaction I've had all week, so I'm really excited about this. <laughs> and it's to see you. Like, I know. I can't go out for steak dinners. This is the next I best know. thing. We haven't had our steak date in, since before the world went on fire and the mm. plague landed. And Literally on fire. I, I will say, um, ladies, I am enjoying the lip kits that we have rocking today. Um, from purple That's and some red. Thing. Well, listen. Gabby, never, never let it not be said that I am not a um, a man of the people and someone who likes to champion women and what they're doing. I, I love it. It's my jam. That is true. You are very good at that. I knew you were going to say man of the people. You're also a man of the ladies. <laughs> a man Gerard. of the ladies. <laughs> a man of the ladies. You're one of the most observant men that I know. So I thank you for that. you being you. Gerard, <laughs> affectiate your post. Is that on your Bumble profile? <laughs> it should be. I am a man of the ladies. First of all, ain't nobody on Bumble, but yes. <laughs> speak, for, speak for yourself, sir. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, it's not Bumble. It's not cool anymore. Oh yeah, what, what is it now? What is it? It's Hinge. Is that the is that the cool? I I did hear about that. Some so I heard some twenty something year olds talking about that, being like, "Yo, Hinge." I'm like, "What the fuck is Hinge?" Like, there is Hinge, yes, as as the thirty something of the group. There is there's Hinge. Um, yeah, you just made it sound so old, Gerard. I mean, I, I, I mean, just, I, 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 I am old. Like I want to meet people out in the streets, but since there are no streets, yeah, mm. there are no streets. I mean, there are streets. They're just empty, <laughs> right? Like, right, yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> we just ain't doing nothing in these streets. Uh, oh, no. But we we are excited to have Kathy on because obviously, as we mentioned, um, she is a journalist and an author. Uh, God save the queens, um, but the women in hip hop. That book is already out, but paperback will be uh, be re released shortly. And I love the love the plug. Always got to promo your stuff. And and you can get the CD version too. Oh, Ooh. and a CD version. And we have the forthcoming baby girl, right. better known as Aaliyah, coming out in 2021. Again, love it. Rep, rep it all the way. A name that everyone who knows her music, who knows R&B, hip hop, like, who just is around the culture. Like, yo, that's a story and a book that we, we have so many questions. And I'm so, I can't wait to, to dive into that. 
But before we even get to that moment, how did you get here, Kathy? Did you, were you a young kid and were you like, I've always loved music, I want to work in music, and here I am? You know, that's actually a really good question. Um, when I do these like artist bios, right, and I interview artists and I ask them when they got started, there's always this like trajectory, right? Like I remember I was singing in front of my parents and they were like, oh, let's get you to talent shows and stuff like that. And I think like most of my experience in working with music came from rebellion mm -hmm. because, you know, when you're growing up in, you know, an Italian household and your kind of career paths are laid out before you. I think that my decision was like the hard left of the family, right? <laughs> uh, but as far as like being a music fan, I've always loved music. I was just, I was like a weirdo because I, <laughs> I used to like stand at the end, um, end of my driveway because I wasn't allowed to cross the street. And I had a Michael Jackson jacket mm. and I would just be, and I would be standing like banging on the garbage can, like singing. And it was, I think about stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh, I guess you really did, you know. And then I had the um, Debbie Gibson's black top hat. Like I really thought I was like in it. If there was a prop, I had the prop, right? Like I was just, and then it was around, I think, was it like sixth grade, fifth grade, when I was first introduced to TLC, and mm -hmm. I bought, um, you know, the Dwayne Wayne from A Different World, the sunglasses, mm -hmm. the glasses, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what a condom was that left I had in her eye, so I balled, I balled up um, saran wrap, and I like stuck it on the back of an index card, and I put it through one of the lenses, and I used to wear it like I thought I was left eye, so I, <laughs> I was always just like... <laughs> I was always a unique child, um, but oh, I also wrote. I also wrote a lot. I used to. I used to write little raps about the soap operas my mom used to watch. And um, by the time I got to high school, I was like head first in hip hop. And then by the time I got to college, that's when I started working for the Roots. You know, while I was in high school, though, I did work at a record store, and my section was like the hip hop section. So. By the time I got to college and, you know, I was going the route of like, I was going to go to law school, actually. And I just at some point, I just decided against it. And I was like, let's give this a try. And I knew that, you know, I tried everything in, um, I tried everything in, in the music industry. I've worked in, at record labels and publicity. I've worked for radio stations. I've worked for artist management companies. Um, I've done social media, all of that stuff. And writing was the thing that stuck. And I started, what I, what I realized was when I was working at these labels, I had this connection to the artists and it became the thing where I was like fascinated by their stories more so than trying to like worry about the label bottom line, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that the longer I wrote, the more I was able to realize that it was more about telling their stories, even beyond be, like getting clickbait or having your cover story show up on entertainment tonight yep. or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what like literally brought me here is just the, the art of storytelling, you know, where it's a slick wreck and outcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you said so much there. And first I have to go back to, ooh, on the TLC tip. Listen, ooh. that album fire like <laughs> so slept on so slept on and people came for me for bringing that up in god save the queens because they're like tlc's an r&b group and i'm like so i guess drake is an r&b group too then right. you know yeah. because yeah. It's, it's, the perception is so interesting because I, I would put god rest her soul i would put left eye against any dude nowadays and she would just <laughs> like clean up you know what, what i love about your story too is sort of the connection that you feel and had with the artist, even at a young age, right? Because right. you self-described, you said it yourself, in many ways you, you felt like an outcast, right? Like an outcast may be like as a, pejor as, as a pejorative, I mean, people see it negatively, but I think really what you're saying is you saw yourself somehow as different, right? Like not mm -hmm. different as in like I'm better than anybody or special, but like I just see and think about things in a different way. And the people who I identify right. with are these artists and musicians because most of them, when they were children, if you were to ask them, they saw the world <laughs> right. in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, right. they're not, it's, 
it's a mainstream thing, right? Like they're not like, okay, I go to school and I do this and I want to become a lawyer. And that's not, that's not how their brains work, right? They are mm-hmm. much more captivated by storytelling and imagination and like these far off fa- fantastical lands and worlds, like, which again, to some people, what are you, are you crazy? Are you weird? No, I'm not weird. It's just where my, it's how my mind and my brain works. And I think mm-hmm. it's so wonderful how you were able to feel that connection so young with the artist. And then it sort of transitioned right into your career. Obviously you tried the different things that you said, working at the label, radio stations, all that. Right. But that was the tie back all along. Right. Um, is that connection. And I, that's, but that's so many of us and so many people are afraid to jump out and be like, well, what is that thing that I like that's like unique or makes me different, right? Like it, it's, right, it's fascinating. Right, right. It's really fascinating. Yeah. And I think what's interesting too, Jaron, you touch upon this and Kathy, you talk about this a lot, is that you might not know what that end goal is. So I think there's a really important education piece that you talk about. We talk all about the importance of education on our show is you might not know what that end goal is, but you're learning all about it. Like I thought I wanted to be a designer or a stylist when I was younger, so I worked in retail. And when Kathy and I met, I was an intern for a photo shoot and I was one of the stylists on the shoot. So it's, it's like figuring that out, kind of seeing what sticks and recognizing that there's an interest there. Like there are ways to follow your dreams. So tell us more about kind of when you really knew and when you started doing deeper pieces like I know you worked with Prodigy and um with your book like when did you really transition from being yeah absolutely from more of a a range to more hyper-focused content you know I really would um give credit to when I was writing for Vice because Vice gave me the flexibility to find my voice and I think that because by the time I was. I started in a very weird period for for journalism, specifically hip hop journalism, because the the print world was like phasing out, and then the um, digital world was kind of slowly inching in, right? And I had been writing these think pieces on the Roots message boards, and I was just like these op eds that. I, I would just babble. There was like a section called the lesson and I would just be like, and I would always like go to like challenge quest love. And it was all about like Lauren Hill and the roots not aligning with her. And I, I think about these things now. And I, I even like, as I tell, retell these things, I'm just like, what were you doing? But all right, you, you were just, you were just passionate. You were banging on your trash can again, you know, in your Michael Jackson jacket. But, um, I think for me, once I discovered my voice, right? Like my writer voice, thanks to Vice, Vice Voice, I started to realize that that's where it's become about like a frozen dinner that you're serving, right? Mm-hmm. And, it, and it has to be like a full course meal that, that you're, you're giving to people. And I think that was really the turning point for me where I decided that I had to do these like more meaningful pieces. But there was, um, there was a period of time prior to that. I still didn't know my voice because my first couple of writing gigs involved just doing Q and A's. And I think it's a lot harder to obviously weave a story together with a Q and A. They're a lot easier to write, mm-hmm. but they're harder to get to the heart of, of the project uh, or the artist, um, the subject. And I did this interview with an artist who, he was a legendary hip hop artist and um, he attempted suicide. And he attempted suicide prior, like let's, let's say we scheduled the interview on a Friday to be done on Sunday, he attempted suicide on Saturday, Mm. right? And something, we did the interview from his hospital bed, right? And then he read the interview and I packed as much as I possibly could in that introduction about what a legend he was. And he called me like a week later when he got out of the hospital and he said, you know, somebody found me after I attempted suicide but I read your, your article on me and I felt like I was washed. I felt like I had no hope. I wasn't going to like get back out there. But when I read the words you said about me, I realized that there's more to like live for. And I'm not saying that like I saved this man's life, right. but I realized that words have power in that mm-hmm. moment. Right. So that was my first like cue. And that, that really happened. I was, I was only a writer for like maybe three years, but that was the first thing in my head where it's like at some point, the, the, um, the end goal has to be something more meaningful, you know, and slowly, but surely I was able to 
kind of put that in there. I feel like I'm, you know, I'm in the phase now where the pop star already had the hit and now you can start doing like your like, you know, crunchy grassroots stuff, you know? <laughs> like I'm like I'm like I'm like I'm like Pink's second album, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. It's like it's it's just like it's like you've done you've done everything you can to to create the you, you bring people in with the flashy stuff and now you can focus on the stuff that's a little more meaningful. And and lucky for me, the meaningful stuff is still very high profile and, yeah. you know, out there. So, so you, yeah. you, you wrote, you've written for Vice, um, Double XL, The Source. I mean, you've been in all these major publications and you talked about finding your voice. And as a journalist myself and as a writer, you got to go through these sort of challenges when you come up with a piece, right? Let's. Uh, can you give an example or a time where you went into you pitched an idea for a feature story mm-hmm. or whatever, and okay, you got the green light. You're going out there. You you do the interviews. You're collecting your information, and then the story you ha- you have a clear idea. All right, this is going to be my 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 joint, right? Like I got my intro, and you're out yeah. there, and man, this interview goes somewhere else, and it just takes you to a place, and you're like, shit, this is not what I want to write about, but. It turns out like either it comes out better or it makes you think about something different about yourself. You gotta give our audience a little bit of an uh, insight into that. Oh man, you know, hmm. There's a couple of examples actually, so that's it's a good problem to have, right? <laughs> I well, actually, this is a really funny story, and, and it's so I was supposed to be I was covering an Amy Winehouse concert. Right. And it was right around the time Back to Black had like just released and it was at um the Highline Ballroom. Mm-hmm. And I was like a, a fan of Amy. You know, she was she was awesome and, and like I loved like what she was doing and everything. And I was just I was a fan, you know. I was a part of I loved Amy Winehouse and Lily Allen. Like I was really just you know, and especially Lily Allen prom dresses and Jordans, like, mm-hmm. oh my God, right? <laughs> but Amy, so I'm at I'm at the Highline Ballroom and I'm, I'm covering this show and the, the VIP section of uh, the now closed Highline is just very small and it's just got a couple of little booths, right? And then there's just like a, a fence, I guess, <laughs> that kind of like separates everything, right? So I was there and I'm, I'm standing like this and I have my little reporter notebook and I'm just like, <laughs> whatever. And this dude comes, this dude is like sitting at a table and he's like, yeah, got to, go to sit, love, come, you know, got to stand love, come, come sit over here. And I go, I was like, okay, right? <laughs> so, I, you know, I was with a friend of mine, and we're, we just kind of sit there, and we're, like, now sitting practically with, with um, this, this guy and a bunch of people. And he's smoking, and, you know, he doesn't care. He's, like, he owns the place as far as he's concerned. And <laughs> Amy's singing, and all of a sudden she, like, turns, and she looks right at me. And she looks to the guy and then she looks at me and then she just like starts giving me this like dirty look. And in the darkest parts of her song, she's like singing at me and, um, and like, like angry, like at me. And I'm just like, what am I doing? What am I doing? <laughs> I didn't realize I was sitting next to Blake uh, Fielder Civil. That was her man. <laughs> and we didn't find out that she was with him until like weeks <laughs> later. And then I realized I was like, Oh, like I'm sitting, she's looking at me like, okay, yeah, like who's, who's, <laughs> about to take her hair down. And I was just like, and I remember I was like writing and I had to write this from this perspective of just focusing on the music and not that this woman had daggers for me. And I remember like years and years later, uh, I did this piece for Pitchfork and I opened it with, I never met Amy Winehouse, but I met her side eye once. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, so I got to at least write about this experience, but there's been a lot of weird moments like that where I'm just like, oh, this isn't how it was planned, but all right, well, let's just keep writing through it. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. Love that. <laughs> but, yeah. like, so did they meet on hinge or bumble? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm, like, I'm like, um, you know, are, are you are you a man of the people? Like- <laughs> <laughs> see, see, not that see, that that could have been me because I would have known. I'd have been like, yeah, nah, you can't really sit over here because Amy might have some problems. Oh, he didn't so. care too, and he was like smoking, and he was like when she was singing, he's like going whoa, and I was like, oh, he must be really into it. Look, me, <laughs> big fan, huge. He must be- 
he must be, he must be a big fan. All right, right on. <laughs> and little do I know, she's like got like death eyes. She's like looking at me like oh, I will man. Get be. <laughs> You know, so you, you, you've done features, you've done Q&As, right? But you've, you've also, you've written one book, you're in the process of writing another book. Like, as you know, feature, right, Q&A, recaps, feature length writing, and those are different processes, right? right? What has the Aaliyah book writing process been like for you? It's harder because you know the ending. Your hero dies at the end. Right. You know how this story ends. Not that we didn't know how God Save the Queens ends, but it's still open ended. Right. Mm -hmm. Like um, there's a finality to the Aaliyah story that's more not to say more unfortunate, but her, it's harder, especially being such a fan of hers. And then you're in the middle of a pandemic and every day you're getting these like death toll numbers mm -hmm. because our country can't get it together. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. You're writing about death. You're getting numbers about death. It's, it's, it's just like a constant thing. And I think like that was, it was harder to keep tapping into the creative space without staying in the sad space. Because when you're writing about something that's so close to the heart, especially I was such, I still am such an Aaliyah fan. And I'm, I was a fan of everyone in God Save the Queens, but thankfully they're still here, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the, the hardest part was the emotional overhaul. But then also providing an experience to the reader who still is just so confused after 20 years of what really happened. Mm -hmm. And even prior to that, with the whole R. Kelly situation, mm -hmm. everyone was just really confused. So it's like these building blocks of like putting everything together and making sure that I left no stone unturned and, but still being respectful to her and her family and her legacy. And that was just something where I've always been a thorough writer, but the combing through that I've had to do with this was just, it's, it's unbelievable, but people are going to read this book and they're just not going to know what to do with themselves. You, you obviously, you know, you mentioned that, you know, the ending. So this is a two parter. Do you feel like, Oh man, I want to cram as much stuff in before the death and of that stuff you cram in, how are the decisions about what to include? I mean, obviously you have to touch on everything, and to be respectful, I mean, how deep do you go into the R. Kelly stuff? Well, I think what we have to remember, too, is when Aaliyah was still alive and when the whole R. Kelly situation came about, she was viewed as this, like, teen with raging hormones. And when you look at surviving R. Kelly and you see that she really was a victim along with the other girls, to sit there and to hide that is like shaming Aaliyah once again. And... I, at first, when I when I pitched this book, I turned down so like deals because I I didn't want to focus on R. Kelly. Like I wanted to start in 1996, but then I saw Surviving R. Kelly, and I was just like, you know what? Somebody's got to come through and talk about what a demon <laughs> he is, mm -hmm. and how in mm -hmm. spite of his demonic ways, Aaliyah became a superstar. And I think that's something that we fail to really recognize when you talk about Aaliyah's legacy is all that she endured and still kept going and changed music, changed fashion, changed all of that. So to deny the painful part of her story is to then deny the triumph that came after it, you know? So I think like I I didn't I didn't want to go into like gory detail, but I did what I had to do as a journalist um, and, you know, state the facts or at least state what has been on record. But I think at the heart of it, people who truly admired Aaliyah and, and people who may not have known her at all will just be really shocked by the, um, the strength and the resilience that she had following all of that mm -hmm. and considering that she endured it at 14 and 15 years old. Mm -hmm. how, how receptive... Wow have people been in terms of in your interview process, right? Because obviously when you're writing a book, you have to get, mm -hmm. you got to talk to talk to sources. So how good were people about talking, uh, talking about this stuff? <clears throat> it's a 50, 50 split. I, um, you know, there's some people who are very into talking about it and there's some people who have tucked it away and, and 
put it where it needs to be. And that's fine too. I think, you know, grief isn't linear. So people who are attached to her very, in a very specific way, sometimes don't want to talk about these things. But the thing is the people, the quotables from certain people, we've read them already. Mm -hmm. We've heard that, Mm -hmm. you know, I talk, I talk to the other man. I talk to the one who was watching the quotable talk to Aaliyah. Mm-hmm. That's where you get the real story. Mm-hmm. Because if you're getting, you know, high profile mm-hmm. talking about high profile, mm-hmm. that's not the story. Mm-hmm. The story is watching the two high profiles interact. That's and the those PR are the people, version of it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I'm I'm talking to the, the people who observed the entire room. And that's where you get more stories that you've never even heard before. Mm-hmm. You know, um, a lot of what has been reported on Aaliyah has always been like, she was shy and she was timid. She was sweet. Every time she walked in a room, she lit it up. And that's true. You know, um, everyone has mentioned what an angelic quality Aaliyah had. But that doesn't tell you anything about right. her story. Right. Or really her character and who she was. Mm-hmm. Because let me tell you something. That woman smiled through a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. And I think that to just make her seem like she was just this bright, cheery being without like expressing what came behind that smile, you're not doing her any justice. And you're certainly not doing justice to the person who's reading it who has spent their whole life smiling uh, behind pain, right? So that's the thing, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that the story was told correctly. I love that. I'm I'm looking, I'm looking forward to this book and I I know that the Barry Hankerson part is going to be very interesting for me when you, when when we get to that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be a ride. <laughs> and, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll leave it there. No, it's is yeah. this is this is exciting. I'm uh, it, just from a standpoint of diving deep into this cuz so much of it is just like, to your point what's out there what we've heard but I'm like man these dots aren't connecting, right? <laughs> like it, Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's it, when I got this, when I got this, it was like uh, like opening a puzzle box where all the pieces were the same color and you're just having to like put them together by shape. And then once you got the shape, then you wipe it away and you get the, the picture. That's how I'm, you know, that's how I envision it. Like I just literally dumped puzzle pieces face down on a table and I'm like, let's, let's try it this way. You know, so <laughs> let's really challenge ourselves. So yeah, I love it. Um, this book will be out August of August of 2021, correct? Yeah, August 24th, whoa, 2021. That is. But we have a pre-sale coming up. (laughs) I do, and the big cover reveal. I've really got to shout out um, Aaliyah's fans, you know, Team Aaliyah, Aaliyah Army, Young Nation, all these, like, like Aaliyah's hives that are just so amped for this because this is for them, essentially, you know. So they were the ones that have kind of forced Simon & Schuster's hand to make this pre-sale happen earlier and do the big cover reveal because they're the ones that are like pushing, like we need this, we need this, especially in the midst of having no streaming music, mm-hmm. you know, on Aaliyah, they, they want, they want something and they need something and they deserve something. They're the ones that have been holding her down for two decades. Mm-hmm. What's, oh. the, what's the latest on that Kathy in the streaming? I'm like, yo man, I, I have to go like dig into my parents, like garage and find CDs of her. Cause I'm like, I can't get like, where is it? I, Anything I, anywhere. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's tricky because you know, you're dealing with a lot of moving parts when it comes to an estate of an artist. And I only know this from my experience with other artists who have passed away. So um, there's, I, and I clear some of it up in the book, just an explanation of what exactly is going on. And by the time the book prints, something might have changed by then. So we're actually working down to the wire if something changes by like Olia's birthday, let's say, because there's always, it seems like there's always something like attached to a landmark year. But I think like when it comes to, like why we don't have the music. I think there is a part of it that is quite painful letting it out into the world. You know, there's something that you do want to hold on to, I I guess if I'm, if I'm sympathizing with how, you know, Barry Hankerson may be viewing this as like the the asset, like that, that thing that he has of hers that he doesn't want to, I don't want to say lack of a better word, share. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. But there is a, another thing that involves just the current state of streaming music and how much money you don't make as a streaming artist. So you don't want to look at it down to like nickels and dimes, but it's a business. I don't know. It's a business. It, yeah. it is a business. It is a business. 
So. This is this is fascinating. I, I mean, Gabby, Jesus, I could probably talk to her for two more hours about. Like, I know. I was going to say we'll have an, a special after show with Gabby, <laughs> only for this episode. If you guys want to see it, but, but guys, the after party. yeah, the, the after after party. Uh, but guys, don't go anywhere. We're going to be back with America's number one segment, Shoe and Tell, and it's going to be all about Kathy, and she's going to have some cool kicks for you guys to see. So don't go anywhere. What's up, guys? We are back with our girl, Kathy, and it is time for America's number one segment, Shoe and Tell. All right, bah, bah, Kathy. Bah, bah, bah. Oh, oh, I didn't even give you the whole, the whole like, announcements and the, say, and, and the horns. I know, I know. Going. Um, we love people that show us their shoes and, you know, because we are a sneaker show <clears> after <throat> all, but why they're important to you. So, Kathy, the floor is yours. Okay, so wait, let me get my first pair. So I should say... Um, I'm not like a hype beast when it comes to sneakers. Like I used to have the, the back to school pack dunks with the marble notebook, Mm -hmm. um, that I got from like flight club. And then I think I donated them because they started to bother me. I'm flat footed. So I struggle. So Nike is always a problem for you. Flat foot. Nike it is, but the utility brand, the utility lines Mm -hmm. are always the one. So I have a funny story about these. Yeah, do you remember that? I knew, I knew you were going to show those. Yep. Mm-hmm. So here's the story with these, okay? I was, like, playing around online, and I saw an ad for those, I don't are they sneaker boots? Like, what are they? <laughs> yeah, I've got snoots. Um, so I saw, I saw this, this, like, uh, this ad, and I was just like, oh, I need these. And I clicked, and I was like, they're sold out. So I hit Gavin, and I was like, there's these boot sneakers that I need. And she's like, all right, I'm not really into the whole utility thing, but because you love them, I will find you a link because this goes against everything I believe in, but I will find you this link. And she found me one. And I really, there's a part of me that actually believes that I'm the only person on earth that has them because every time I wear them, somebody's looking at me like, yeah, hold Whoa, up, hold, like, hold up, hold, hold, hold up one of them again, so we so we yeah. can all take a look. <clears throat> yeah, man, these are listen. The, the Air, are they Air Force One utility line. Yeah. yeah. So, mm-hmm. Gabby, yeah. I know you you have strong feelings about mixing. About everything. <laughs> oh, well, yes. Strong feelings about everything. About, about, everything. Everything. about everything, but specifically <laughs> about combo sneaker boots, like. I don't know, though. I'm kind of into it. And I, a few years ago, I went against my norm, and I got a pair of the Lunar Force Ones. They look kind of like a duck boot meets a Timberland meets a Nike with a little bit of some studding on it. And let me tell you, those are one of my favorite pairs. I see that. Also because almost nobody ever has them, but I do. It's like the it's Jeep Wave. Whenever I see one person in them, it's a little like, mm, you know, <laughs> you know the box. That's but how I feel about these. The functionality, and, and Gerard, we talk about this a lot, and yeah. I think, you know, it's very hard to meet something that is fashion meets function, and what we like on this show is to have your unique perspective. Uh, we don't care if you have the hypest sneakers in the collection, like, cool, if you want to and you want to flex and that's your bag, great, but if it's something that makes you happy and, like, knowing you for a long time, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to find these for Kathy, and I put on those lunar forces, and they are good in the snow, they are good in the rain. Exactly. They're not heavy. They don't cut off circulation like the trendy hunter boots do, which, don't get me wrong, I could be a little hype beast. I had my pair of those, too. And, you know, I could feel my toes by the time I got to my destination, you know, because beauty is pain. But I, I do have a new appreciation and respect for something that is equally functional as it is fashionable. And, I mean, those are fire. Yeah. And if they make you happy, then I'm happy. They make me incredibly happy. I'm actually surprised that, Gabby, you didn't break out into song and start singing Cheryl Crow, Crow if it makes you happy. Because that's like... Pun, I can't hit puns, the high note. That's puns, high. Oh, okay. Because puns are your thing. That's your. I, puns are my thing, uh, <laughs> but I have really bad vocal cords, which is why when I do karaoke, I rap. I don't sing. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want that vocal fry. Got you. Got you. Nah. <laughs> Love them. All right, Kathy, that. what else you got for us? So this next pair, these are very basic Nikes. Wait, hold on. And But there's a story behind them. So see these? Yo, right? you know what those look like oh. to me? <laughs> are you going to say those the Tanjunes? They look like Tanjunes to me. <laughs> So these were my mother's and my mom passed away last year and I wear these whenever I'm doing something super important. So 
I wore them when I picked up the copies of my book. And uh, most recently, I wore them when I bought my new car. So whenever there's like a special occasion, I wear her sneakers. So that's my that's my special. These are my special Nikes. So yeah, yeah, hold, those hold, hold, hold those up again. Yeah, they they look. I mean, they, they're a little, you know. They look very Tanjun, Gabby. Like that's, that's yeah. I was the gonna say, I'd love to know what style those are. Yeah, yeah. Does it say? My, I mean, if, uh, by a style number, I'm but not, I, unfortunately, I don't, I, I don't remember the style numbers all the top of my head, so I wouldn't. Have, but like. Yeah, they 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 look like so, the, the classic Nike uh, Tanjun, which of course, as we know, that's their number one selling shoe. Number one selling that's shoe in terms of volume and dollars. So it says running on the inside, if that means anything. And the, the Tanjun is a running shoe, so yeah. yeah. Or yeah, it's a Tanjun or a Roche. Yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. So I love that though. It's a beautiful story. I do love yeah. that though, Kathy. Like it, it's, I mean, look, it's whatever it's you're, you're carrying a piece of her with you right and it's mm-hmm. right, Absolutely. right and in a way you feel like she's watching over you in these important moments and you are sharing them with her right because yeah she would sure. have loved to be with you to pick up the books and to do right so like all those mm-hmm. things uh because i imagine she was very influential in shaping who you Absolutely. are as a writer and and, and your voice yeah. so that's that's wonderful I mean, she was the reason why that I was able to, when I talk about that rebellion, you know, when you're in a household where, you know, um, when you're in an environment where pathways are laid out for you, if I, you know, go to my mom and say, I think I'm going to interview rappers for a living. And she (laughs) said, okay, I think you should do it. And that's literally how it went down. And, you know, um, but, you know like being a part of her legacy there's pretty big shoes to fill but i fit into those so <laughs> i was gonna say there's a there's a whole new meaning to walking a mile mm-hmm. in somebody else's shoes so i love that about it well yeah and I, um i had a, a school um named after her where she she taught in, in patterson new jersey and when i went to go drive past the school for the first time i put those shoes on too so wow that is Beautiful. incredible um you know we talked a little bit uh, last segment just about your, your your journey, and obviously we know people do this all the time. They hear people like you, they tee people like, we want to do what you do. And, and I'm always like, awesome. Like, there's no, I mean, especially, obviously for you, same for me, there is no, we didn't do a linear path to get here, right? Some no, people do, right? Some people follow right. the, all right, I'm going to J school, da 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 and you now more and more as we get into this age, that's going to become less and less likely that that's going to be the way to mm-hmm. go, right? Absolutely, um, right. So what are your what is your advice for young people out there who are like, I want to get into this business and or I just want to do, I want to follow my passion? Mm. Well, I think first and foremost, it's identifying what that passion is. And I know that there's like different twists and turns where you come to the conclusion of like what that passion has like manifested for your career. But there's... Where we're at right now with the written word as it pertains to like journalism and interviewing artists and stuff is that sometimes people look at the journalism aspect of it as like a launch pad for something else that has nothing to do with journalism, right? Like I'll do a couple of articles so then I can move over to camera, right? And my advice is then just skip the writing part and go right to camera, you know, do, do podcasts or vlogs, all of those things. If you're a writer and you're a writer, writer, stick to the writer path. And it's not easy nowadays. Like it's, it's really not, it's never been easy. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to get visibility because of just the impact of social media. But if writing is your passion, then get on that path and stay on that path. If TV or camera is your passion, this ain't it, right? Because you leave really quickly when, when that's the, when that's the end goal. And, you know, for anyone who is a writer who wants to kind of just get in there, I have, I've always just abided by the biggie line, um, stay low and keep firing. So just, you know, keep going. And, and, and I know that sounds like generic advice, but, you know, you're talking to someone who handed out flyers from the roots and now has the roots on speed dial. So it one thing can eventually get to the other. And there's a lot in between. But I think that when you kind of like focus in on what it is that you want to do and you just keep doing it, it's like the repetition. What is it like three times becomes the habit or something? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Eventually, eventually it'll it'll stick. And you know, so many people I was having this conversation the other day where you know, someone was like, has um, an awesome magazine of their own. I was like, well, how do I get into double XL? And I'm like, 
WSL is an amazing publication, but build yours. Like this is the thing. We're we're at a loss right now of magazines and, mm-hmm. and publications mm-hmm. that are dedicated to hip hop. So keep that going and, and build that because that's how a place like Double XL started or the source started. Like we need more of those newsletters that become magazines. Mm-hmm. Because there's nothing right now. And I think with um, the sales for vinyl still being up, you know, I think that there's definitely proof that the old school analog ways can still do big things for digital, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I, yeah, I, stay I low. love it. Love that. <laughs> stay low and keep firing. I love that. Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't touch into this, but quickly, how was it the first time you started working for quest love and thought like were, were you just like oh my god my life is amazing i could hang out with the roots <laughs> <laughs> like did you have a fangirl moment <laughs> I, I if amir's watching this he's gonna be like oh well, i start my my i started with arguing with him with quest love <laughs> so it's and that's been the basis of our friendship it's just <laughs> our, our, it's just arguing with him about Everything. how much i love lauren hill <laughs> and i and it's like and it still is that same thing because it's just it's it's just that where it, there's always just some sort of a joke that's part of that. But you know you do you do kind of like sometimes you sit there and you're just like oh this is this is life. And um, I really had the the because I grew so much with with um with the roots with Questlove. Mm-hmm. So we're talking now twenty something years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was able to kind of like watch the roots turn into what they are. And I'm just so incredibly proud of like Amir and just like who he is as like just a human. But my, I'll never forget this one moment where I was, I was at Prodigy's house and he was like playing his new album and he had this shirt on. I have a picture of it, funny enough, and just has Mob Deep across the back. And he was like playing something and I'm just like sitting on the couch and I was like looking down and then I like looked up and I see like P at a mixing board, you know, and he's about to play me some unreleased stuff. And I'm just like, that's your friend. <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. That was where, that's where, you know, like I had, that was like one of those moments. I was just like, you're you're watching like that, that that's yeah. your friend yeah. like, you know yeah. and, that's dope. and you just you're just like oh wow okay <laughs> you know but this is my life <laughs> love it yep. mm-hmm. how did we get here right <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly but like yeah. attracts like that's what it is you are correct hey. on that gabby you uh you got any parting shots about lip gets <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I wore this lip color because I know that my girl Kathy's signature look is a red lip. So I felt like I had to pay homage, but not not too much. So I went a little purpley, you know, a little nod to our girl Tara who we had on a few weeks ago. But I want to know, tell us about your red lip color, how that became your signature look, and what color is it? Well, this I one wanna- is um, um, a special MAC kind of um, lip gloss wand. I don't really remember the red that it is because I wore this. This is the same lip that I have in my, um, I think it is. Yeah, this was the same lip that I wore when I was doing my headshots, right? Uh So when they did, when they did my lip color, they put it on me and it's, it's a wand that dries matte, Mm -hmm. right? So it's to take it off. I've, I've learned, um, my friend, kid sister, taught me something recently. Mm. She said that if you put olive oil on your lips and then you dampen a paper towel and you do that, it comes off and it came off like that. So, wow. you know, thanks. Mom. Yeah, and normally you have to let your face on fire to get it off. Literally. So, like, uh, literally. Yeah. <laughs> but the red lip, I will tell you when the, uh, the red lip came to be. This is actually, no one knows this. So I was... I was going to a, a Santi Gold listening session um, at a at Cornerstone, which put out the fader. And I remember I went to I, I was at like Garden State Plaza, Jersey stand up, and <laughs> I was like I was like looking for like a quick like color, like I was like because in my mind, okay. I was like, okay, you're going to a Santi Gold listening, so you have to look like super cool. And like these, are, this is the internal dialogue, right? And I'm just like, all right, don't mess this up. Right. Like you and I still have that conversation with me, even though I like I said to you before we recorded that I'm in a car up with my headphones. But so I 
went to I went to Garden State Plaza and I was like I was like I need like an interesting color and it was just like and I had always worn like burgundy that was like kind of my thing like you know leaning more towards the the purplish side and I bought this like lipstick and I was like okay right and then I like, I'm heading into the city and I was like yeah that's one thing I do too sometimes I don't put on my lip until I get ready to get out right like in the car before you get smart to the- yeah smart. Just like you know, I was like racing, and then and you know, um, Cornerstone was on, I think, like 23rd Street, and I, I was free parking after six or whatever, so I'm like pulled up <laughs> and I put the lipstick on. I was like, Oh my god, that's bright red, <laughs> right? And I was like, I was like, All right, well, I, I guess we're doing this, yep. I guess this mm-hmm. is what we're doing. And I remember I walked in, and somebody I forget who it was is like, Whoa, like, like, I like the bright red on you, like, this is. Like a new whatever, and I didn't want to be like thanks. It was for Santi Gold listening, but I was just like, <laughs> and I kept it. I, I kept it, and and from that point on, that's how red became my color by an accident. I love it. Now, now you can't go anywhere without it. It is a good color. <laughs> it, it's yeah, a, now I can. It's a wonderful color. Shouts that. to red. <laughs> yes, shouts to red. <laughs> shouts to red. Today's episode is brought to you by, by the red. No, this was awesome, Kathy. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, Show us that book again, God Save the Queens. Paperback's coming out when? November 10th. Awesome. The Central History of the Women in Hip Hop. You guys got to get into that. And of course, Baby Girl, better known as Alia, coming out August 24th, 2021. Pre-sale for Amazon. Coming soon. Get ready, folks. It's going to be good. And as always, you know where to find the Kicks and Shit Show. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, SoundCloud. My God, we're everywhere. At Kicks and Shit Show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. At JS Hector, at Gabby Rosenthal. And we'll see you guys next time. Peace.